Welcome to Data Communications and Networking. In this course, we're going to go through the fundamentals of data communications and networking. We'll start off by establishing a basic model for a data circuit and then some standard circuit configurations and along the way explain LANs and WANs and routers and packets. We'll go through the critical ideas of packets and frames and how those two things are related. And we'll finish off with a summary, if you will, of the first three courses, looking at the network cloud and why people always draw pictures of networks as clouds and what's actually going on inside that cloud. And what we'll end up seeing is that there are three basic services from telecommunication service providers, dedicated lines, phone calls, and bandwidth on demand services, also known as full period services, circuit switching, and packet switching. We covered circuit switching in course one, and we covered dedicated lines in course two. In this course, we're going to cover the ideas of packets. And what we'll end up seeing in the last chapter is that there are three kinds of network services. There are three kinds of equipment that are used to provide these. So how do packets and frames go together? What is the main purpose of doing frames? This is a short-term memory test if you're watching this tape sequentially. I just told you. It's the error detection. We take a chunk of data, put some reliable error checking, some local addressing, and some framing on there, and we transmit it, and we retransmit it if something goes wrong with the error checking. And once it gets there, we know that that chunk of data has been transmitted to the right computer on the same circuit, and there are no errors in it. That's what frames are for. How does this fit in with packets? Well, when we transmit a packet from the insurance company to AT&T over an access circuit, we want to make sure that the packet gets there with no errors in the packet, right? So what do we do? We take the packet and put it in a frame. The purpose of a frame is to take a block of data, whatever it is, put a reliable error detection mechanism on, some local control information, and framing, and transmit it on a circuit, and retransmit it if something goes wrong. And once it's successful, we have moved that block of data to the correct computer on the same circuit, and we know that there are no errors in it. This block of data, what that actually is, is a packet. Packets get carried inside frames. The purpose of a packet is to be a chunk of your message, whatever it is, like a piece of an email message, with a network address on the front. And the network address is the final destination address. This is the information that all of the network equipment, like routers, look at and use as the basis of making route decisions. So what we do is we move a packet from one computer to another by putting it inside a frame and then moving the frame across and retransmitting the frame if something goes wrong with it. And then once it gets to the other computer and the frame passes its error check, we extract the packet out of the frame and give it to the network software running on that computer to look at the network address to figure out how to route it. Does one packet fit exactly inside one frame? If I were king, yes. The payload space available in a frame would be exactly the size of a packet. So we just make up a packet, drop it in a frame, and off it goes. Is that how it works in the real world? Well, in many cases, no. 
Because the problem is one standards committee who has their meetings in Hawaii will decide that frames should carry X number of bytes as a payload. And then another group who has their meetings in Geneva, they'll decide that packet should be Y bytes long. And Y does not equal X. Just as an example, in the beginning of the internet, we were carrying IP packets in ATM cells. And we go through all this stuff in the next video, number four. But let's just say that the most popular size of an IP packet in those days was 64 bytes long. And yet the ATM frame-like thing called a cell, it holds 48 bytes. So whenever you wanted to transmit a packet across the core of the internet, you would take the first 48 bytes of the packet, put it in an ATM thing, send that off, and then take the remaining 16 bytes of the packet, put it in a second ATM thing, pad the rest out with zeros, and transmit that. And if you lost one of them, you lost both of them. If I were king, well, this is one thing that we can tweak on networks, is to organize things so that packets fit exactly inside frames or some multiple number of packets fit exactly inside a frame so we don't have to start chopping packets up and sending them in two pieces. That is a recipe for all sorts of problems, especially in voice over IP. There's something strange about this picture. There are two addresses in this picture. There's a network address and a link address. There's an address in the front of the packet, and there's an address in the front of the frame. Are these the same things? No. The way that I like to think about this is that frames are a low-level idea. In fact, frames are the lowest-level idea, besides just moving bits around. And the information on a frame is just locally meaningful on this multi-drop circuit with several stations physically plugged together. That link address indicates which station should react to this data because everybody's going to hear it. So this is locally meaningful. Packets are a higher level idea. And the control information on a packet, the network address, is meaningful to everybody. To make this a little bit more clear, let's back up one graphic. Let's say that we have this arrangement where we have an insurance company office in Sacramento and we've got an insurance company office in New York and we're going to use AT&T's packet network to communicate. This client computer in Sacramento wants to access a database in New York. So what it does is it takes a piece of its database inquiry message and puts the network address of the server in New York on the front. So this is going to say, send this to ABC Insurance Company, computer number 78 in New York City. That's what's sitting on the front of the packet. Then we take that packet and put it in a frame. And we haven't gone anywhere yet. We're just organizing data on the source computer. We take that packet and put it in a frame, and on the front of the frame we say where it's going next on the local cabling. What address do we put on the frame? Well, you might be tempted to say the LAN switch, but at this level of discussion the LAN switch is invisible. Where is that frame going to go next after it leaves the source client computer in Sacramento? Well, it's going to go to the insurance company's router in Sacramento. So the packet is going to say, send this to ABC Insurance Company, computer number 78 in New York City. On the frame, it's going to say, send this to our router in Sacramento. And then it sends it over the LAN, and possibly everybody gets it, including the router, which is just another station on the LAN. They all bring it in, check the air check, look at the address, the insurance company's router in Sacramento says, well, that's me. So it grabs the data out of the frame, which is a packet, and gives it to the routing software running on the router. The routing software then looks at the network address, and it looks up in a routing table. And it's going to find an entry that says, well, 
If you want to go anywhere outside this building, it doesn't matter where, you got to go to AT&T's router in Sacramento. So the insurance company's router in Sacramento is going to take that packet and stick it in a frame and put AT&T router in Sacramento on the front of the frame and then send it over the access circuit. AT&T's router in Sacramento is going to pull in the packet, look at the address which says send this to ABC Insurance Company computer number 78 New York City and it's going to look up in a routing table and it's going to find well if you want to get to anywhere in New York City it doesn't matter where you got to go to Chicago. So it'll take the packet, put it in a frame, and send it to the AT&T router in Chicago. And that one eventually will send it to the AT&T router in New York City. That one will look up in its routing table, and it'll find an entry that says, well, if you want to go anywhere at ABC Insurance Company in New York City, it doesn't matter where, you got to go to ABC Insurance Company's router in New York City. So it'll send the packet in a frame to ABC Insurance Company's router in New York City, and then that one is responsible for figuring out which is computer number 78 on the local cabling. So the idea here is that the address on the packet never changes. That's the final destination address. The address on the frame changes as we go from one hop to the next because that says where it's going next on this particular piece of cable.